delighted to have you here with us this afternoon. This session has been in the planning for some time. Um, Annette and I have been talking about this and hatching a plan for about a year. Uh, we've got a good mix of speakers for you this afternoon. And if you've attended any of our sessions previously, you'll know that we talk about the maritime sector and the breadth of it and the opportunities. Uh, we do general sessions and then I like to do industry specific ones as well. So this is an industry specific um, session and we are exploring engineering opportunities. So I'm, I'm really delighted to have Annette Valentine with us this afternoon. Here's my contact at Engineering UK, who's going to talk about the work that they do and I guess how we work together, but also about the um, tomorrow's future. You, you'll have to remind me, Annette. Tomorrow's Engineers programme. Sorry, um, oh, it's been one of those days. My head, you know when your head feels like you're a computer laptop with too many tabs open? That's where my head is today, I'm afraid. Uh, anyway, always honest, much too honest, overshare. Anyway, uh, so this afternoon you've got speakers, we've got Annette here from Engineering UK. I'm delighted to be joined by Richard Hill from Kinetic, who's going to talk about uh, what what we're doing with them and, and their programmes, their entry programmes, early careers, a bit about them as a as an organisation. And Rob is here from Talis as well. First six months of this job, I was calling you fails, but then someone pulled me up on it. So it's Talis, who's also going to talk about engineering opportunities. Um, our, our fourth speaker, Laura from STEM Unity, unfortunately is unlikely to be able to join us, but she has recorded a presentation which, if the technology gods are with me, will play, but you always take your life in your hands with that bit. Um, I'm sure it will. She will try and join us, but if she's not able to, I've got a backup and I've got a video that I can play. It's very relaxed. This may not take an hour and a half. We might be done quicker. Um, each of the speakers, I'm sure, are happy to take questions at the end of their sessions, their slot on the agenda, or at the end we can round up. Um, if you'd like to ask questions in the chat or to stick your hand up if you're brave enough to ask it in person, that's absolutely fine. As I said, there's other, there was about 30 that were registered the last time I checked the numbers. So I know stuff happens in schools and colleges and anything, um, anything is possible, but I'll just let people join as they come along if, if extras get to us. And if not, they'll be able to watch this um, online afterwards. So I'll stop rabbiting because that's enough from me. And I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand over to um, Annette, who's going to talk about Engineering UK, Tomorrow's Engineers, etc. Annette, over to you. Thank you, Lorna. And um, hi, everyone. Great to meet you. The dog appears to have joined me, so apologies if he starts playing up in the background. Um, I'm Annette Valentine and I work for Engineering UK, as Lorna said. Uh, what I'm going to do over the next 10-15 minutes or so is just tell you a little bit, bit about who we are and what we do, what engineering is, why community outreach is so important and inspiring young people and why that's important. And then I'm going to share some details of our resources and programmes that we've got that could potentially help you uh, with your work to inspire young people. And yes, he has joined me. So apologies about the dog in the background. So first of all, I'm just going to share my screen. But I am actually going to turn my video off and the only reason why is because I'll be looking up at the monitor and it looks like I'm rolling my eyes when I do that and I'm genuinely not. So I'm just going to turn my video off and share my screen and hopefully this works. OK, can everybody see that OK? Yeah, it's not the it's not the enlarged version. Yeah, let's do that now. How's that? Is that better? Yes, that's better. Yeah. That's OK, well, I've done the first bit anyway. So a little bit about who we are then at Engineering UK. Uh, we're located in London, but we've got a UK wide remit. Um, through people like myself, there's seven of me across the UK that work locally in our regions with employers, with um, organisations that are involved in 
uh, reaching out to schools and inspiring young people and with organisations that connect with schools. So we work locally as business partnership managers, but we've got a UK remit to inspire and inform young people about engineering and to grow the number and diversity of tomorrow's engineers. And we do that in three ways. So we produce quite a bit of research, insights, we analyse research and produce trends and um, analyse that information. And that those insights, <coughs> excuse me, inform policy at government level and they help to shape the development of programmes in the wider landscape of organisations that inspire young people about engineering and science. Um, and as I say, uh, the whole purpose of those is to improve delivery and help people strengthen their programmes so that we inspire and inform young people in the best way possible. And a lot of what we do, or in fact, all of what we do is aligned to the Gatsby benchmarks of good practice. And we work for that. We work very closely with the careers and enterprise company and have a partnership agreement in place with them. So I know the Gatsby benchmarks will be familiar to you in schools and I just want to reassure you that everything we do is aligned to those. Um, so we um, run things like the Tomorrow's Engineers Code, which is a community of organisations and people who share a commitment to drive inclusion and inspire that diversity within the future workforce. We share good practice about what works through that community and we develop guidance and toolkits for that community. And we try and help teachers find new and exciting ways to bring STEM to life and enable more young people to experience engineering. And I'll say a little bit more about um, the programmes that we've got to help teachers around that a little bit later. Um, but first of all, what I wanted to do is, apologies, I'm the door. what I wanted to do was share some images with you and thoughts about what engineering is so like many people you know it's very easy to have a, a perception of engineering as as uh, you know quite old-fashioned in dirty factories and all the rest of it and we i'm sure we all know that 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 industry has changed but i just wanted to show you the bre breadth and scope of engineering through a video and i'm keeping my fingers crossed that this works it should be easier actually with um, technology and doing it online. You let me know if it doesn't. Can everybody see the screen OK? We can see your screen, but the video is not playing. All right, OK. Um, I don't know why that is because on my screen it's come through but bear with me it might be that it's just I just need to share a different screen yeah you might have to unshare and then reshare and yeah, then that's what I was thinking best laid plans eh right so if I unshare and then I'm going to share a different screen How's that? Can you see that? Yes. Right, OK, let's go then. No sound, though. No sound? No. Oh. Oh, joy. If you, if you unshare again, and then when you go to share it, there should be a little box for you to tick that says also share sound or. Rather than uh, share that video, what I'll do is I'll put the link to that video in the chat and I would recommend that you just click on it. It's uh, two minutes long and it just showcases the breadth of engineering and how um, how how different engineering is to potentially what your perceptions might be and how modern that that sector is. So I'll put the link in the chat and that's probably something you can have a look at later and apologies about that. Best laid plans, that's technology for you. Uh, so I'll just reshare my screen for the presentation. 
Is that OK? Can you see that? Coming. It's not quite it's not quite there yet. It's coming. Things happening. OK. Any joy? Not yet. And yes, it, it was sharing before, wasn't it? Yeah. I'm just gonna, yeah, it seems to have stuck now completely. Right, I'm just going to talk then um, and hopefully it'll just rectify itself over time. But when you do have a look at that video, you, you will. Ah, right. Hang on. Something is happening now, I think. How's that? Can you see that? Yes. Ah, wonderful. Right, OK. So when you do have a look at that video, what you'll see is how um, interesting and exciting engineering is, modern engineering is, and particularly when you think about uh, the biggest challenge of our age around climate change, engineering is actually right at the heart of that in terms of designing and developing new technologies to produce key clean energy, capturing carbon from the atmosphere, coming up with solutions that enable all of us in our homes and businesses to reduce our carbon footprint. And coming up with that big thinking that's going to be required to design and ma manufacture new technologies that are going to support us in this massive challenge that we've got. And a good example of that is something like nuclear fusion, um, which is really about the process that takes place on the sun. Rather than splitting the atom, it's, atom, it's about producing energy from that fusion process um, here on Earth. So actually there's projects uh, there's projects going on in Europe and global partnerships to actually look at how we harness that technology to produce energy. And if we can solve that problem, that's going to make a massive difference to us in terms of energy production. So that's just one example of where engineers are right at the heart of that. And in fact, there's a, an organisation down in Rotherham that is actually looking at this technology as we speak and developing those technologies for nuclear fusion. So that's really exciting stuff. Um, and th also things about food and water and how we tackle some of the challenges that we're gonna have around food and water um, supplies and coming up with new solutions to grow crops in a more sustainable way. So there's some really great things that engineers are gonna be involved in as we move forward. So, my screen appears to have completely frozen now and won't let me move on. So I think all you can see is the presentation slide that says this is engineering. Is that right? Uh, I'm afraid so. Do you want me to try and open it from this end, Annette, and see if that if it works? It might. You've got a different um, version, Lorna. Um, what I am going to do is I'm just going to stop sharing and share again, just see if it makes a difference and just releases it. I think it's because it's still thinking that I want to share the video and that might have just slowed it down. Are you seeing the presentation again? It's gone back to the slide that's got the this is engineering link on it. Yeah, it's 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 not having it. It won't let me move around. Anyway, so. Um, <laughs> if we think about then that that excitement of engineering, what are those key messages to young people? going to be. So it's it's things about recognising that engineering actually within the engineering sector there's a job for everyone and that it's not just uh, you know engineers themselves. Engineering as a sector needs project managers, it needs people who can develop tenders, it needs marketing professionals. So the sector itself is actually quite broad ranging but actually in terms of engineers the salary is actually really good as well and the opportunities in terms of uh, taking a young person through an apprenticeship and, and enabling them to develop and potentially do a degree whilst they work or developing their role through the apprenticeship is, is really quite good. 
So actually, as a career, engineering is 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 a really great thing for young people to consider. And the reason why it's important is that we know there are some real shortfalls in engineering. Um, so, for example, 40% uh, of decision makers in small companies say that it's more difficult now than it was five years ago to find employees in the it, with the right skills. And if you think about um, what that means in terms of the energy sector, particularly in the context of climate change, that sector alone will need 400,000 new roles over the next 30 years in order to achieve that net zero challenge that we're hearing so much about in the news. And 260,000 of those roles are newly created. So a lot of those jobs don't exist yet. So there's some really good opportunities ahead. And also we're losing talent due to retirement. And that's a real critical issue in the engineering sector. So um, I spoke a little bit earlier about nuclear and I'm going to use that example again. 70% of that workforce will be retired by 2025. That's a massive number and a massive backfill that we need to bring where we need to bring young people in. And in fact, that sector is doing some really good work in the area of trying to attract more young people to nuclear. And we've got competition as well from skilled workers in other sectors. So the challenge that engineering has is a challenge that's faced by many other sectors as well. So the competition for those that small pool of, of talent is actually quite fierce. And when you think about the limited pipeline of young people that are choosing STEM qualifications and career pathways, that's only adding to the problem. And on top of that, there's a lack of diversity in the workforce as well, which affects productivity and growth. Because one of the things that the sector does realise is that without that diversity of talent in the workforce, there isn't the kind of creativity of thought and actually it's that creativity of thought that um, organisations and engineering companies right at the heart of um, the climate challenge really need in order to meet that challenge. So there's some really, you know, really good reasons why engineering should be at the forefront of um, young people's minds. And when you think about what some of our research shows in terms of current perceptions of engineering, only 40% of 11 to 19 year olds, um, well, 47% of 11 to 19 year olds say they know very little or almost nothing about what engineers do. And that knowledge is distorted um, with engineering being seen as difficult, complicated, dirty or a man's profession, which I mentioned earlier. And actually, if I could have shown that video, you'd have seen it, seen it wasn't, which is a shame, but never mind. Um, and the knowledge and aptitude and capability that young people have to pursue STEM is often derived from parents. But again, what our research shows is that over 50% of parents say they don't know a lot about what people in engineering do. So actually, it's difficult to kind of encourage young people to think about engineering as a career where knowledge about engineering is actually quite slim. And what we also know, of course, and um, as teachers, you'll probably be aware of this anyway through the careers work that you do um, with the Gatsby benchmarks and that you need to do in schools anyway, is that where young people do have those regular and meaningful encounters with industry and engineers and anybody else really within industry, then it makes a massive difference to a how much young people know about future careers and the extent to which they will consider those careers as well. So for instance, um, just one encounter has make, means that young people are three and a half times, their knowledge is three and a half times greater of engi around engineering than it would be if they hadn't had an encounter. So it, it does make a massive difference. And on top of that, and probably more important for you as teachers is that other research shows that those interacting with careers ambassadors are more motiv motivated and do better in their GCSEs. So those kind of experiences and encounters with professionals outside of school make a massive difference to young people. So this is where I move on to just sharing with you some of our resources that can help you. And I'm kind of hoping that um, 
if I try and share my screen here, that you can probably see the main one that I wanted to share with you. Can you actually see that screen and does it say Neon? Yeah, we can. Yeah, brilliant. So this is the main um, programme, if you like, that we, we run, which is directly targeted at teachers. So if you just Google Neon Futures, this will come up. And what Neon is, is a website that brings together brilliant experiences, inspiring careers resources and stories that showcase modern engineering. We want to make it easier for teachers to identify um, those good experience that they can be confident, a good quality with clear learning of outcomes and Neon Futures is the place to go for that. Um, you'll be able to save, download and order some of the uh, favourite experiences and resources that are, that are on Neon to help you inspire and inform your students about potential careers. And you can see there's a line under careers resources. Actually, I might just click on that and just see if it comes up for you. I don't think it's going to. Um, Sorry, just out of interest, what age uh, group does that cover? It covers uh, primary through to secondary. So all age ranges really through the school age. So it does pick up some primary and um, primarily we target 11 to 14 because we find that that's a key time in a young person's life um, before they choose their subjects. So obviously if we're wanting more young people to come into STEM careers, then they need to be choosing science um, at year nine. So yeah, that's a key phase for us, 11 to 19, but NEON does cover the full range. So I would definitely recommend having a look at that. And there's some great resources on there um, that you'll be able to pick up and use, download, request hard copies of, things that you can put up in your classroom, as well as identifying experiences that you can expose your young people to. So that's NEON Futures, and that's one of our prime products. And then the other thing that you may well have heard of is the Big Bang Fair. So the Big Bang Fair is um, an event that celebrates the amazing work of scientists and engineers. Um, normally we run that face to face at the NEC with 80,000 children coming through the doors over four days. Um, but of course, we can't do that at the minute with the pandemic pandemic. So we have a digital version of the Big Bang Fair and we had over 49,000 users to the Big Bang Fair this year when we ran the digital event. So it's a great way of exposing young people to really exciting elements of engineering and they can get to meet engineers, they can talk to engineers, they can find out about careers in different sectors. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great inspirational fair. And there's also linked to that the Big Bang competition where young people can work on projects um, over a period of time and enter those into a national competition. Um, and there's lots of prizes around science, engineering and all sorts of things around that. So normally we have a celebratory event at the NEC, but obviously again, we're having to do that digitally at the minute. And um, the other two, finally, just before I close, are a couple of workshops and programmes that we run again uh, to inspire young people. One is called Energy Quest. Uh, which is a curriculum linked workshop style programme which encourages young people to find out all about sustainable energy and learn about associated engineering careers. Um, again, at age range 11 to 14, that can be teacher led or you can bring in a facilitator to help you with that. And then finally, something called the Robotics Challenge, which is again curriculum linked. That's a bit more of a year long programme, competition based, Get, getting students working together in teams to solve real world engineering and technology challenges. So I'm really sorry the presentation didn't work. That's the joys of technology. And um, as I say, I'll put the details of the uh, video that I wanted to show in the chat and I'll share the presentation with Lorna so Lorna can circulate it and you can have a look at it later. OK, I'm, I'm open to questions. Annette, I've already shared the link to the video in the chat, so I've done that. I've done oh, that for you already. And also to the Neon uh, website. So that's also that's also in the chat. Um, has anyone got any questions for Annette? Anything? The only questions I've got about, there is one from 
Um, oh, it says maintenance. I'm sure that's not the person's name. It could be. It could be Mr. or Miss or Mr. Maintenance. But anyway, Annette, could I be provided, please, with contacts with representatives for the East of England area? Looking, yes. looking at networking, encouraging beyond the maritime ambassador work that I currently already do. Oh, lovely. Little shout out for the ambassador work. Fabulous. From my experience, when I was younger, my teachers and careers advisors knew little about careers and progression routes. Therefore, I'm pleased to help and would like. Oh, it's Victoria. She just told me who it is. Victoria is one of our industry ambassadors um, who, who talks with schools. Uh, I'll put the two of you. I'll connect you two and put you in touch. That's fine. No Thank problem. You. Thank you, Victoria. Nice to um, nice to, to see you. Any other questions from anybody or anyone brave enough to um, to ask out loud or have you, is there anything? I'm not sure I'm seeing anything other than please. Can we share the slides and the link to the video, et cetera, in the chat? OK, fantastic. Um, we'll move on to the next part of the session then. So hopefully that's given you um, an, an up to date um, sort of summary of where engineering uk are at at the moment um engineering being one of the industries that we would define in the maritime sector and annette and i talk on a fairly regular basis about um joint projects that we can do together because we're both trying to do the same thing my messaging is always that maritime isn't just about careers at sea it's about you know the 75 percent of the jobs in maritime are actually onshore and we're trying to share that message and just to endorse exactly what um, um, Annette was talking about in terms of, you know, the engineering sector employs people who do jobs other than as engineers. Maritime's the same. And one of the things that I hear from um, ports and harbours is that's a particular type of organisation that are really striving forwards with um, digitalization automation of 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 process um robotics etc cetera, etc cetera. and they can't do that without engineers without computer coders etc um, and i'm finding it difficult to attract those people so hopefully you'll get some more information as the session goes on that will help you uh, support um young people and adult job seekers better I was I wonder Annette and I had a conversation recently about whether the word engineering in itself was a barrier because people have a picture in their mind of what that means and we we talked about all sorts of alternatives creative problem solver was one of them um, but uh, anyway I'm going to pass on to the next speaker so the next person on our agenda is Rob Jones from Talis Rob, we're not having a huge amount of luck with the technology today, but we're um, absolutely willing to give it another go. If you'd like to take over and, and are you sharing a presentation or are you just talking to us? Hey everyone, yeah, we'll give it a go, but technology never works as any engineer will tell you, adapt and overcome. So I am going to attempt to use our corporate presentation as a framework, but talk around it really. Um, because we have engineers doing everything. Um, I'm one of the biggest companies you've never heard of. Um, so I'm just gonna try and get the right file up, wait for it. Um, so as we're going, bit of my background, I've been with Talis since 2018, um, after 13 years in the Royal Navy. So I did my apprenticeship in the Royal Navy as a Marine engineer, um, and then decided that 13 years of going to sea was enough for me. Um, so I now work in Manchester and believe it or not, there is maritime availability in Manchester. Who knew? Um, has that presentation worked? We're not seeing the Okay, right. We're just going to go straight to adapt and overcome then. We knew it was going to happen. Um, <clears throat> right. So I'm working for a company called Talis. Um, Talis is a French multinational, but has a big presence in the UK. Um, we cover all the big markets. We do defence, including the Royal Navy. Um, we do space, we do ground transport, we do cyber security, including the nuclear power stations for EDF. And we do bank card cryptography and passports. We do the UK Blue Passports, believe it or not. Um, we actually make them in Manchester. The factory is really small, um, but it's got a great output and it's a great engineering team there as well. Um, so there's 
what I'm trying to get over is that this is a big company all over the UK that's got loads of opportunities for engineers. Uh, my primary experience with the company so far has been the underwater systems business line. Um, so we make sonar for the Navy. That's our biggest thing. And we do that in a couple of places around England. Uh, we employ about 300 engineers doing that, including a significant amount of women. Um, and we bring in apprentices and graduates from graduate development programmes directly from university and college, as well as working with the Prince's Trust as well. Um, we recently engaged two years ago um, to bring in about 15 Prince's Trust candidates um, who were young people from disadvantaged backgrounds that may not have considered engineering as a career. And we provided them with some coaching and mentoring alongside the Prince's Trust and have helped support them through doing a HNC and moving on to an advanced apprenticeship. And it's been really rewarding to see these young people actually go and learn these skills from a workforce that potentially once have considered engineering originally. Um, so that's some of the kind of outreach work we currently do. We have a STEM ambassadors coordinator as well, Charlene, whose details I will share with this group and she can help organise engineers from all of our sites around the UK to support local education and um, support teachers. A lot of us are registered STEM ambassadors, um, so you may often find the TALIS engineer through STEM ambassadors website as well if you're looking for support with activities. Um, but we tend to say yes to things <laughs> when it comes to STEM because we're, our engineers are really passionate about trying to bring more people into our industry. It's a massive growth industry for us at the minute. We've not stopped recruiting for about three or four years. Um, in particular, we're looking for systems engineers. So that is engineers who will take a requirement, so what the customer wants, and then bring it all together as a technical solution and help to make it come alive um, so that's those big picture thinkers um, and we've got a number of extremely young systems engineers and project design authorities actually um, who are coming through so it's quite good for young engineers in that respect if you look at the number of millennials who are in senior leadership positions or um, winning awards in the defense industry Talis has a really good showing for that uh, we've got a young lady called Charlotte Rigby She's a bit of a poster girl for us. Um, she's currently running mine warfare integration trials. She only left university a couple of years ago. Um, so she's flying. You know, it's one of those places where if you're interested in engineering, then the company will tend to give you the, the ability to support what you're interested in with whatever flavour. With the maritime bits in particular, we've got sonar for ships and submarines. Um, we do autonomous work as well. So we're making robot mine hunters for the Royal Navy in France as a joint programme currently, um, and that's a programme Charlotte's actually working on. Um, so that this is really critical life-saving work that is going to save lives and help remove that horrible legacy of um, seagoing mines that's been around since the Second World War. Um, and that's making the sea lanes safe for everyone. Um, so that's how this work applies to helping everyone. And this is really rewarding work for people to do as well, actually taking on these kind of vague defence concepts um, and then making them applicable so that we can make the sea a safer and more effective place. Um, we've also done some work with the Queen Elizabeth carriers doing the power generation for that. So we employ a lot of electrical engineers, uh, mechanical engineers. We've just been doing 3D model based definition, trying to teach people to move away from 2D drawings, which was always a bit I hated in school when I was doing my engineering and my uh, GCSE in electronics doing all schematic drawing. Uh, we're moving away from that now and teaching our apprentices to as well. Um, and actually, our, most of our young apprentices at the minute have just completed their British standard training um, that's been funded by the company as well so that they can develop their professional skills and be even more employable. Um, and that really at the cutting edge of engineering design at the minute. Um, and this was great because it came about because younger engineers were sick of doing it old school. <laughs> there I say, you know, people wanted to see change and as engineers, the company supported them. So there's quite a lot of variety with the uh, company, particularly the maritime sector. I mean, sonar is the core of the maritime careers. Um, I know you're never too old. <laughs> um, yeah, so now's the core for the maritime sector, which is what we're probably trying to focus on here, but there's a lot of other opportunities and also you can move around the company as well. Um, 
the company is very big on supporting your through life development, including international movements as well. So we have maritime career exchanges with Brest in France. Um, we've got people in Belize in France. We have Australia. Um, we were just working on that Australian submarine contract that's just been cancelled. <laughs> so we'll see what happens with the new one. You know, but we've been working with Australians as well. And as maritime engineers in the UK, I think that's a fantastic opportunity to learn a bit about other cultures, speak to people around the world and compare your experiences. Um, there is more that binds us than differs us, um, although the time difference between us and Australia means that their director is an absolute hero because I think he was in the office at nearly midnight just to speak to us, which was really nice of them. Um, in the UK, we got away with it time wise, um, but it's those kind of opportunities that the big companies can offer you. So it's something worth thinking about if you're looking at employment with one of the bigger engineering companies. Suppose has anyone got any questions about the maritime sector or oh, the best way? Yeah, you know, free floor. Anything you'd like to know? Rob, Rob can I can ask, I ask how many people you employ in the UK? And 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 could you give us an idea of where the geographical sites are, please? Sure. Um, I think we're about five thousand people. Um, we have a big manufacturing base, but actually the core of the company is engineering. You know, we are a research and development company at our core. Um, uh, we have nine primary sites. Um, the big ones that jump out at me, we've got Reading, we've got Manchester in um, Cheadle Heath, which is my home site. We've got Templecombe down in Somerset. We've got Belfast, we've got Glasgow, um, but Doncaster. So th there is a, a really diverse spread of sites, actually. If you Google Talis, um, the, the UK page actually has a really nice pretty map that shows the dots of where they are. Um, and we can also provide early careers information as well. Ratio of females in the workplace, it's not enough. As with engineering companies, it's something we're very passionate about changing at the minute. Um, I would actually say my opposite number head of engineering operations is a woman. She's a millennial as well. She's um, 32. And she's in a very senior engineering management position now. Um, the proportion we've got targets at the minute to increase the number of senior hires for women, and that's something the group is actively working on. Um, and that's being metricated through pay as well. It's not just um, something they're saying, you know, we, that's part of our employment targets. Um, so we, we are actively committed to making sure we make this happen. Um, and I will say, actually, we do tend to hire more women when they present for interviewing. You know, we, I had some fantastic interviews, but I think, as we all know, the, the hardest bit is getting women to, especially young women, to consider it as a career opportunity uh, because it still does have a very male appearance, uh, as Lorna pointed out, and that's something we're really trying to change. Um, um, I wonder, I want any, sorry, I'm hearing an echo now. I don't know what is going on with the technology today. The last time we had trouble like this in one of these sessions, it transpired that Microsoft Teams were doing an update and no one knew about it, but we all knew about it by the end of the week with everyone was pulling their hair out saying, my meetings haven't been working properly. So I'm really sorry for that. We will share all the presentations with you afterwards and I'll have a link to them with the recording saved on, on to the website. Um, one last question, Rob. If you if you had been able to give your 16 year old self some careers advice, what, what would that have been? Do it all again, basically. Um, I cannot advocate enough for apprenticeships. Um, I did well at GCSEs, um, A levels or AS levels. I completely bummed down to that and I was pretty much on the edge of thinking, well, maybe that's not for me. Um, I was convinced to give it another try and did an apprenticeship with the Royal Navy and did incredibly well and I've ended up I'm now a European engineer, a chartered engineer. So it clearly wasn't intellect, it was perhaps my education at the time and everyone has different routes. Um, apprenticeships I found fantastic, that hands-on experience as a technician really helped me become a, a better chartered engineer I feel. But it's horses for courses, you know, there, there's some fantastic graduate programmes as well that give people all the skills they need. I say just look for employers who are going to support your education as well. So look for those um, companies that will pay your professional fees. They will give you graduate development programs. They will provide mentors on company time because that's where you're really going to see the best value to support you as a young engineer in your career. 
Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, um, I think yeah. I think it's Edo. Edo. I'm sorry. You said that you oh, want. Right. To yes. It's uh, actually, my name is Rebecca. Edo stands for Education Development Officer. Oh, I'm um, really sorry. No, 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 don't be silly. That's fine. Um, and I work with the Wellington Trust. I just wanted to say two things now, actually, uh, Rob, just to reply to your a point about trying to encourage women to actually even um, apply. I saw a fantastic lecture by a lady called Averill MacDonald and she works at um, a universe, Reading University and she was just so good at uh, identifying key words which are needed within a um, within a job spec and within um, a job application to encourage females to even apply. So using words like teamwork, family, all that sort of stuff is just absolutely crucial to getting women to apply, not because the job itself is any different, but because it's those words which encourage the females to think, actually, yes, that is something for me. Uh, so I would strongly recommend talking to her if you haven't already done so, uh, because she's just wonderful. Um, the other point that I wanted to make, it, um, I dropped a message into the chat with Lorna, was that with the word um, engineering, I, I've been working with Solent University on a new project which we are developing called um, uh, Future Engineers. We're developing a summer school, Future Maritime Engineers specifically. And I've been talking with Jonathan Ridley, that, who's the head of engineering at Solent University. And he said that engineering, the derivation of the word, actually is, is nothing to do with getting your hands dirty. It actually is, is linked with the word ingeniator, which is a Latin word. Um, and it's derived from the words ingenier, which is to create, generate and devise and ingenium, which is cleverness. And it's just fantastic because that takes away all the muck and the dirt and the spanners and the oily rags, which are very often associated with engineering. And it just goes to show that you are using your brain when you are using when you are an engineer and I just thought that was so wonderful and if anybody else wants to uh, to find that just type in engineer derivation into Google and it comes up with it it's superb. It's interesting I, I listened to a, a blog recently which I will share with you all after this which um, it was a recording by Annette um, her name's not Annette I told you my brain was full of too many open tabs Amelia Gould from BAE actually, who is a very senior engineering director with um, BAE Combat Systems. And it's a super blog. Um, I'll, I'll find it in a minute and I'll put it in the in the chat. But she talks about problem solving and she talks about how um, in careers education, formally, formally, um, boys and girls would respond to that word in a completely different way I mean I don't you're right that there are misconceptions in our brain about engineering being dirty and around lathes and you need to wear a, a sort of a, a boiler suit and, and hard hat and you know steel toe caps and so on and in her blog Amelia talks about not even having paper plans now you know the plans will come up on a on a, a an iPad or some sort of device um, they're 3D plans. You need to be able to interpret those rather than having a, a paper plan as was. And I remember in my former role with, um, with Eastley College being at a, and I'll never forget this day actually, being at a um, careers fair at one of the secondary schools in Romsey in Hampshire. And the children had all had a talk the week before. I think it was in an engineering UK thing that had happened and that was all as part of their sort of annual careers program so they came into the careers fair with all the colleges there trying to sell their post-16 colleges and so on, uh, courses and when he said what do you want to be they said I want to be an engineer and we would say that's fantastic what sort of engineer do you want to be they had no idea they oh. just knew that that was a good word it was a good word and they'd they'd heard it at school and they'd been home and talked to their parents about it and no doubt their parents had said 
yeah, fantastic, be an engineer. But then they came to us and, and I was saying to them, do you want to be a computer services engineer? Do you want, to, you know, what's trying to pull that? I'll never forget that. But oh. um, it's just, these things stick with you, don't they? Yeah. Um, there's a couple of there's a couple of questions coming through. One that I just want to read out in case no one's seeing it. Carol had asked about engineering apprenticeships and cutoffs. I'm not I'm not sure if that's so. Annette can apply to be an apprentice with Chalice potentially, um, but um, we know that there's no cutoff for apprenticeships. There is no upper age limit. You know, really good quality um, employers pay apprentices well as well, which can be one of the barriers for people coming into an apprenticeship later on. But in fact, of course, if it's a large um, if it's a large employer who's already paying the apprenticeship levy, they will use their levy to put people that are even in senior positions to do higher level apprenticeships. Is that the same with Talis? Rob, well, yeah, we, we very much try to avoid that because uh, we're really short of engineers, as the UK knows. So we're much more interested in getting new engineers in uh, rather than getting seniors through. But, you know, big companies do that if there is a need for like an MBA apprenticeship or something. I'm sure areas of the business do. Um, but in, a, in the engineering job families in particular for systems, software and hardware engineering for us, we very much focus our levy on getting people in. Um, and they are paid well as well. You know, we actually pay our apprentices as um, junior to mid range technicians. Um, so they, they are above the apprentices wage in the UK as such. Um, and it being a French multinational, the a lot of the HR terms are very good as well, um, because you probably know that French unions have a lot more sway over there. And whilst it's not all combined, you know, those standards are upheld worldwide in the company. Um, so it's a really good environment for the apprentices. Um, there's definitely not a cut off, I'd say, just go on to come back to that with Carol um, and take apprentices from any age. You know, um, we're very much age, gender is not a factor. Nothing is, you know, engineers can come from anywhere and be anyone. Everyone's got that talent to do clever things with their mind. And our HR team's picked up the same thing. You know, we our internal branding for engineering now is clever people doing clever things. And it's all kind of bright colours and cogs and eyes and very much moving away from um, span a monkey in a boiler suit with steel toe caps, which is hilarious because that's what I spent 13 years of my career at sea doing. But that was one element of maritime engineering. You know, that's very different to maritime engineering, shoreside designing these ships, building an oil rig. You know, being an operator, it, or being an operational engineer is very different to being a design engineer. And they're both fantastic career paths. I've enjoyed doing both, but they are different things. Um, I would also say that I do know plenty of women who do stomp around in boiler suits and there are far better engineers than me. Um, my boss, my best boss, was a lady called Lieutenant Commander Nikki Clear. Um, and I remember her for, for forever because she was a fantastic mentor, really good engineer, and she really set a good example. So just because it's a boiler suit, don't let it put you off, you know, ladies, you can go anywhere. <laughs> Fantastic. Could you just give us an idea of the um, starting salaries for apprenticeships in engineering? Oh, now you're asking. Um, I want to say 15 to 18, but don't hold me to it and HR is probably going to jump on me. Um, obviously, that, that all, all, all the college fees are covered and everything through the apprentice levy and transport to um college and bits like that as well um, in addition to that to yes levy. yeah yeah that that's that's all on top of um yeah, yeah. you know because the our apprentices we tend to do a college day and four work days so for those five days they are with a design team learning their trade with a mentor um, and then one day of the week, they'd be at college, uh, a local education facility that the, com the company works with doing their qualification. And then we have the mentors in for endpoint assessments on site. Um, so we're very much about they are fully integrated employees rather than just an apprentice who happens to do a placement with us. Um, you know, the apprentice is very much part of the team. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you. One, one final question, Rob, from me. Um, I've put the link into the chat for your the apprenticeship pages within the Talus um, uh, website, so people can follow that up. Is there a particular time of year when people start? Is it a September start, or do your apprentices come in throughout the year? 
So I believe that HR are currently working on a yearly start. I do know that actually we've just opened our window now because we had internal comms. So for the next couple of months at least, I know they're seeking applications to bring people in. Um, it is quite a competitive process, you know, because we do offer a good package and we want to get the best people. Um, but I think they tend to bring them together and try and teach like an academic year as well because it gives the apprenticeships a, a way of bonding together and um, so they're continuing their experience and they've got a, a peer cohort you know because they do things like out, outward bound they'll do social activities as well as their their education and the work placements as well um, I think if we made it too sporadic throughout the year then you'd be a bit more fragmented you know we effectively get your, your school year joining as a cohort no matter how old they are um, and they get a chance to like go to a Lake Districts for our found activities and they'll meet at sites and do rotations. Um, so it gives them a bit more flexibility for the programme. So I think we're annual at the minute. Okay, okay. That's fine. That's, That's fine. Not it's a criticism. And I'm definitely going to Rob, thank you very much for that. If there's any other questions, uh, if you just want to pop them in the chat, we'll pick up on them later. I'm going to hand over to Richard now from Kinetic and give him control of the screen. Richard, it's all yours. Fab. Uh, I'll introduce myself and then uh, what I'll do is I'll introduce you to Kate, who's hopefully also on the call uh, and uh, hi Kate thank you uh, again uh, Kate's got the slide pack so uh, we'll give that a go but there's a fair chance by the looks of it that that won't work uh, my name is Richard Hill and I'm what's called a group leader uh, within uh, Kinetic we operate under a matrix organization so I look after the functional management of about 70 staff and sit within a discipline of about 300 staff called mechanical engineering and in mechanical engineering we do stress analysis and uh, mechanical hardware design uh, we do um, fluid dynamics naval architecting we've got um, uh, non-destructive testing we've got manufacturing we've got a whole host of things uh, across a number of domains uh, and a lot of what uh, was it Rob was saying is really similar. We cover things from space uh, to robotics, cyber. Uh, we've got uh, what Kate will talk about down on the south coast. And we've got locations from the Outer Hebrides uh, across the UK. We've also got locations in Belgium, Germany, Australia, uh, America, North America, Canada, uh, and Kent. Uh, <laughs> Kent's not another country. So, um, uh, yeah, we cover a number of areas and uh, they all work on different projects. So there's a fair chance, to, regardless of where you're located, as workload varies between the areas, uh, we manage our peaks and troughs by sharing resources around the country. So there's a fair chance that 80% uh, of what you would do would normally be, say, working on boats, as, as Kate's going to show you. Uh, and in the downtime, if there was any there, then there's a fair chance you may get put on a project for somewhere at Farnborough or etc. So we work very much cross sites. Uh, we worked really hard in the last couple of years to put together a um, cross cutting community that look at design and manufacturing. Uh, and we're in the process of uh, aligning how we measure what good looks like for design engineers and manufacturing engineers, as well as shaping standardized processes and policies. So we're at a point in our company's history uh, where we've gone through a transformation. We've moved from a number of uh, uh, locally organized communities to a global matrix organization where uh, you could end up in, 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 in pots of particular skills. So we've got these cross cutting entities that try and bring together electrical and mechanical or design and stress or design and manufacturing. So we really are trying to stir the pot. And there's a lot of opportunity for mm. anyone, including early careers community, to get involved with shaping our, uh, our, our strategy and our uh, move towards different technologies. So Rob mentioned 3D printing and model-based definition. 
So that's the paperless uh, design definition and, and going away from plans, as I think was mentioned earlier. Uh, we're very much moving that direction as well. Uh, we're also wanting to move in a direction where you could be communicating to Australia using VR goggles uh, and spinning solutions around and then have solutions mature overnight and you join back in the conversation in the morning. So any help with that from our early careers community is, 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 is really uh, helpful. Uh, they bring fresh ideas and fresh energy. Uh, and some of their time can be safeguarded to look into such things as well. Uh, and so it's not so much a hierarchical environment that you'd see in Kinetic. There's a lot of opportunity, regardless of, of seniority, to realise change, which is a, a huge benefit. You don't often get that in large companies where you've got the ability to change in, in real terms what we do uh, and get involved in that. So, for example, we had a grad plus a couple of years that was asked to look at our 3D printing across the UK and provided £70,000 to go and invest in various bits of 3D printing kit and aligning that community. So that's quite a lot of responsibility for a grad to take on, but uh, we took his recommendations, went with them, implemented what he suggested and now have the kit in place that he said. So I believe that uh, we really do empower our individuals that come along. So uh, that's how I sit in uh, the business. Uh, Kate can tell you more about what goes on in the maritime uh, and we do a whole load of stuff around that as well. So I'll pass you over to Kate and then perhaps at the end we can ask more questions. Thank you, Kate. All right. Can anyone see the presentation? Yes. Woohoo! Yeah, well winner. <laughs> Okay, so as Rich said, I'm Kate. I'm an ex-apprentice. I've worked for Kinetic for 10 years now and um, I am now a production scheduler, but I started as a, as a designer. So um, yeah, it's been and it's continuing, so we'll carry on from here. So um, hopefully if I click, is it going to work? Yes, second slide. Okay, so um, as Rich was telling you, we are a security and defence contractor. Our mission is to be the chosen partner around the world for mission critical solutions, innovating for our customers advantage. What does that honestly mean? It genuinely means that um, our job is to make our customers life easier. They can come to us with a problem. We will either figure out a specific solution for them or work with them to support them in their development of their own capability. We work very heavily with various other contractors such as BAE and Thales, although for a very long time I called them Thanos. I don't know why, it was just the way it was. People call us QuintaQ but we are, I promise, called Kinetic. Apparently it was something to do with our edgy design and our forward pace. So um, we, we have continued that for a long time. Um, we are split into around nine main sectors, which include maritime, uh, aviation and aerospace defence and standard space. Apparently there is a difference between aerospace and space. That's always interesting to learn these things. Inside our maritime sector, we are further split into six sections, which are known as services and products. And these include things such as uh, maritime design software, uh, maritime life support, tests and evaluation, and even down to things like maritime cyber, because cyber is apparently a really big thing in the maritime sector. Who knew? In Kinetic, we do... Um, a section of four types of early careers. So we do graduate placements, apprenticeships, year in industry students and summer placements. Um, our graduate placements tend to be around two years and we will do four placements. Two of those placements will be with your employing group. For example, if you joined as a design graduate, you will do two design graduate placements with your team and two other placements, um, usually of your choice. So there's a wide range of different teams that you can join. If you want to be a structures engineer for six months, crack on, have some fun. It's it is work, but it should be fun as well. Within the apprenticeship programme, we do much like um, Talis do and have a uh, day release for most of our students or apprentices. Um, and that um, can be anything from going to college for day release to even doing block training with certain providers. We've done um, 
external training courses, internal training courses, just as long as we've got a minimum of 20% of your time on the job training, or for that matter, off the job training, um, it fits really well. And our apprentices, uh, our apprentices tend to um, be job specific. So for example, if you join as a workshop apprentice in Hasler, you will tend to live your life as a workshop apprentice in Hasler. That doesn't mean that you will only ever work with them, but it's where you will have your home base. So it's a much more um, structured position versus the graduate programme where you could literally move anywhere over the UK for six months at a, at a specific point in time. Within the year in industry student and the summer placement side, um, it's much the same where it will be a case that you will join one team and you will spend your time with that team. We've got some really good opportunities for that and we have some fantastic um, uh, swap schemes as well with uh, people like the MOD. So we take MOD graduates for a year and sometimes they even take our apprentices and graduates for a certain period of time as well. So that's a really good way to get to know our customer. Inside our early careers programme within Maritime, there are a lot of different opportunities. So you can do things from being what's known as a mechanical engineer, which can literally be anything from you're fitting something in a workshop all the way through to you're doing structural calcs for um, a submarine. Very varied title it is just a title all the way through to uh, things like uh, safety, health and environment uh, technicians and even project management and engineering technicians. So quite limitless opportunities, nine times out of 10, just because that is your title doesn't necessarily mean that um, it explains everything that you do because it very rarely does. Then next slide, um, to get you guys a little bit more into the scheme of what people would do if they had graduate placements with us. I've got a case study for you from our test and evaluation section. So our customer came to us and they said that they were looking at uh, a replenishment at sea um, experiment um, for the new aircraft carrier. So as you are probably all aware, we have a lovely new set of aircraft carriers. However, during development, they realised that this is going to be the first time they did replenishment at sea of a ship that was larger than the replenishment ship. So um, we had to complete some testing to figure out um, which well, figure out if we were going to crash and burn, because it's better to crash and burn with a model that costs a couple hundred grand than it is to crash and burn with an aircraft carrier with lots and lots and lots of people on board. So I have a little bit of a quiz for you guys and feel free to use the chat section to answer it or keep your um, answers to yourself and congratulate yourself later if you choose right. So the question is, what result do you expect us to get? Do you expect uh, the smaller ship to be sucked in by the wake of the larger ship, both models to continue with no problem, or the weight from the larger model to push the smaller ship away? So are the ships going to crash? Are they going to stay away? Or are they going to keep just going straight forwards? To figure this question out, we go into a very simplified for this presentation two-step process <laughs> where we do design and build and test and reporting. So within design and build, our customer comes to us with the requirement. We identify key items such as what type of model it needs to be, how big it needs to be. And for this purpose, accuracy is very important to us. Um, a small issue on a small model is a very big issue on a very big ship. So we have to be um, very precise and um, quite detail orientated. So once we have designed and built our models, we tend to send them up into our testing facilities. So upstairs, I say upstairs because I know the building, but you guys don't. Um, we have a workshop in a downstairs area of a big building called the Ocean Basin. Upstairs, because for some reason it has to be upstairs, um, is a very large swimming pool. It is five and a half metres deep by 60 metres wide by 120 metres long, which to anyone who knows how big that is, it's very big to anyone that doesn't. We can fit a Type 45 destroyer from edge to edge. Um, if we take the roof off our building, which 
we're not planning on doing so we promise we won't do it but it's it's possible uh, so we take the models that we've just manufactured and we um, simulate different running conditions so within these tests we took our aircraft carrier and our refueling tanker and we had to use an autopilot system to uh, run them next to each other and see whether the models would crash together or whether they would push apart um, and it was a pretty interesting trial especially because we had the MOD there and they actually got uh, people to pilot the models so that they actually understood what they were expecting and what the model was performing like so these little balls if anyone can see them the white balls at the top of the model are actually part of a system which we call Qualysis and to anyone who watches um, background films from Hollywood as in this is how we made it these are the same tennis balls which get put onto actors so that they can do motion capture for uh, dance films and Beauty and the Beast and various other things like that so that's a pretty cool system it allows us to get within about a millimeter of accuracy and when you're thinking over 120 meters a millimeter is very good so within our design and build section we had at least and i do say at least um three members of the early careers team supporting us they weren't necessarily in their time at the time. So our designer started as an apprentice um, completed on the job learning and two days a week at college. They, I, because this is me, um, was given control of smaller tasks before moving on to running um, my own projects or being part of joint projects for larger things. So it's the kind of thing where you start off uh, designing a bracket and then suddenly you design an entire model and it's it's all about progression we don't want to throw you in at the deep end and watch you drown we do want to help you swim so uh, that's useful um, I got my degree via distance learning and I am a mainly internally facing role so it's not necessarily very regular that I will face the customer because our customer is our technical lead who um, who comes to us with the requirement so in this case I was responsible for the detailed design of um, the model fit out for the experiment so um, we don't control the outside shape the MOD are firmly in control of that but we control everything that goes into the model to make it do what we're asking it to do so another member of the team is a structural engineer he joined as a mechanical engineering graduate and um, is working towards his master's at the minute he worked during well, he worked in multiple areas of the business during his graduate program he's also mainly internal facing like me but he was responsible for making sure that the model could withstand the force of the waves so the waves in our basin can get pretty rough and the last thing we want is to rip a grp model in half when we're testing it so he is in charge of making sure that we don't damage the model or worse people if something were to go wrong then we have a craftsperson and he started his apprenticeship over 30 years ago and has stayed with the company since then, which is impressive. He has um, many years worth of honed um, hand skills and he also um, utilises more modern technologies such as rapid prototyping, like Rich was saying earlier with the 3D printed components in this perspective his job was to complete the layup of the models and the fit out of the decks and things like that so inside of our models um, it's like an empty shell and you have to put platforms in so you can put instrumentation and things like that that you use to um, measure and control the model with so inside test and evaluation we had an instrumentation engineer he also started his apprenticeship at the same time as i did and he has a lot of um a lot of training on under his belt like hundreds of thousand pounds worth of training under his belt because of the equipment that we use um, he supports the rigging of the model and the fit out but he also uh, looks after some of the internal equipment that we have and he also looks after some of the facility equipment that we have so some of our facilities have things that you don't necessarily ask joe blogs from down the street to come and maintain it has to be maintained by a professional who is knowledgeable about what we're asking for and we tend to internally supply as much as possible when it comes to that. Uh, so he's responsible for fit out of our model with our measuring condition, uh, measuring equipment and our control equipment. 
and then we move on to our technical lead or experiment lead. He started as a graduate and he um, is a through life kind of person. So he will stand with our uh, customer at the beginning and say, OK, Mr. Customer, what do you need? And then he will stand at the end with the customer and say, here you go, Mr. Customer. This is our answer. So um, he needs to be reasonably knowledgeable of all sections of our business, not just um, his small role. He needs to understand how he fits with everyone else, which is um at times rather interesting because depending on which department you're in can depend on how people like to run things but um, usually it's reasonably straightforward. So he is in charge of running the trial and reviewing the results to write a customer report and then last but not least our sixth early careers member is our facility lead. So he started uh, working for the company about two months after I did. After six years of being a technical lead, he moved into the role of being a facility lead. So um, our facility leads, instead of um, focusing on model delivery, they focus on our facilities, so our ocean basin or our ship tank, and um, they make sure that it's not only fully operational, but it's safe to operate because ultimately, our number one thought as a business and feeling as a business is it's not about safety first or anything like that it's about delivering safely it should never be an either or we shouldn't prioritize delivery over safety it should always be delivering safely so um, he is mainly concerned with making sure that we can operate our facility safely and that all of the staff are doing what they need to do. All of the equipment is operational. So he's very involved throughout the trial, but he also faces our customer because if our customer comes with us uh, to us with a very unique need, for example, I want six metre waves, we have to kindly tell them, I'm sorry, if we use six metre waves, we'll flood our entire workshop. It's not really practical. Um, and sometimes they listen. <laughs> so the results. Our tests are in, we've written a report, we're telling our customer, does anyone know what the result was going to be for this? I'm hoping that some of you are going to have said option C, and option C was the um, larger boat was actually forcing the smaller boat away, and because we found that result, the uh, MOD were very happy and managed to go through and fingers crossed this bit will work and they did their very first replenishment at sea and this is a video of um, the first replenishment at sea. Let's get through. So this is our Mars tanker on one side and that is our lovely new aircraft carrier and this is taken from a helicopter, as you can probably tell from the angle, as opposed to a drone. Um, and it's really amazing to be able to take an idea that someone has, build something, test something, and then provide support and knowledge to our customer so that they can deliver what they need to do safely. And ultimately, that is probably the goal of everyone's life is to do things safely. Why would you want to hurt someone always focus on safety but yeah so thank you Kate that's really good I, I, I'm guessing that there's probably too much time for that video to fully play out um, that takes me to my area which is the wider kinetic but I've already kind of rattled off a number of things I'm conscious of the time uh, are we good for questions Lorna is that sort of where you'd like to get to or you're, uh, you're okay for a couple of minutes Laura has managed to join us she's logged in from the car bless her so we've got one more speaker but if there if there are any questions immediate questions that um haven't already been answered if people want to put their hands up now or uh to to type that into the chat perhaps we Perhaps what we could do, it's really fascinating. I love the fact that you made that a problem. I guessed A, so I got it wrong. But then <laughs> I'm not an engineer, so it's probably just as well. <laughs> uh, but there are clearly from the chat, there was a couple of people that guessed C, so that's terrific. I think, I mean, my mind's blown a little bit at the moment with the varieties of entry pathways and the different sorts of jobs. We've, we've had a whole afternoon here of hearing job titles that some of us have never heard of before. And I guess that's the that's the, the secret to this. I have just as I shared um, Talis uh, apprenticeship page and the website, I've done the same for Kinetic. 
Um, I've also put a couple of links um, in the chat. I talked about a podcast from Amelia from BAE. There's a link to that in there. There is um, a link to a, an interview that I did with Amelia and Hebe, one of their apprentices. And also I've put a, um, a link to the careers video that we created in the Solent, which features Kinetic. And I don't know if you see that water tank, but you certainly see one of the water tanks. and. Um, and Tom Courtier is talking about doing scuba diving as part of his job, which again is is just terrific. So if there's no if there's no um, desperate questions at the moment, I'm going to hand over to Laura, who joins us from her car, like a BBC reporter from the scene, who's going to try and share her presentation. But um, I have warned her that we've had a little bit of difficult. A, we've had difficulty with this today anyway, and B, she's doing it from the car, and it would be extremely amazing if that happened. But Laura, over to you. You're on mute, my dear. Hello? Uh, there you are. Hello, we can hear you. Thank you so much for this. No problem at all. And I'm so sorry that um, I was delayed. Now, um, was the, was, am I screen sharing now? Can you see? Do you see my screen? Oh, it's your microphone's muted. It appears when I try to share content, it, it mutes my microphone. So in true teacher style, are you happy for me to try and do it off the cuff without my visuals? But now I'm on mute. Absolutely. And we're going to share all the presentations afterwards, if that's OK with people. Right. Brilliant. Well, you'll just have to look at me instead of the lovely graphics that I had. Um, so I'm Laura Watford. Um, I'm a head of science um, in a small secondary school in the north of Portsmouth. And also with another hat on, I am a teacher coordinator for the Royal Academy of Engineering Connecting STEM Teachers Programme. So for the past five years, I've run a network and uh, we develop uh, brilliant context based uh, resources, STEM resources and STEM boxes for schools, and then we deliver them um, to to uh, training for the teachers in the network area. And then uh, obviously teachers then take them back and embed them in their curriculum and do wonderful STEM things and inspire young people. Um, but a couple of colleagues um, and, and I got together from the Royal Academy. There's 52 of us across the whole country. And we were like, it's great, but it's not enough. And we were like, there's a little bit of disconnect sometimes between um, the wealth of, um, and no, Lorna just mentioned, there was so many job titles that perhaps we hadn't heard of before mentioned earlier. And actually, I think there is just a little bit of disconnect between the wealth of opportunities in our surrounding areas and our curriculum and our student opportunities. So Jordan and I got together with Margaret. So Jordan's based in Sheffield, I'm based in Portsmouth. And Margaret is based up in Glasgow and Margaret came up with this brilliant model of STEM Academy. So she's developed it over three years. She's a research chemist, also trains teachers, and she developed this model where she worked closely with inspiring young professionals in STEM in STEM professions around in Glasgow, combined with some academics working at the university in Glasgow and then combined with teachers and developed video activities for students to complete so they could get a taste of what it would be like to go into, the, into careers that they've perhaps never heard of. And that was STEM Academy Scotland. So during the pandemic, it, it started as face to face, but obviously, as everything had to, went online. Margaret put 27 workshops online in the space of four weeks. She's a wonder woman. And then um, Got in touch with Jordan and I and said actually would your students like to access it as well so we circulated the information across our areas to our schools and 9,000 students accessed five or more workshops and Margaret's been collecting data all ethics approved through Glasgow University and overwhelmingly the STEM attitudes were improving as they as they completed these activities so Margaret was like the next step would surely if they were enjoying our bespoke tailored activity workshops for the kids in Scotland, the next step would surely be to make some bespoke ones for kids in your area. So that's what we're doing. <laughs> so I'm going to fast forward. It was a long year of setting up STEM Unity. Um, so we set up, uh, we applied to become a charity and we've just been granted charity status. And we have STEM Academy North and STEM Academy South. 
we are working with some really big names. We did some pilot videos with DSTL, which are almost ready in editing for release. And then um, we have just started a high funded project to develop three more videos, which are so exciting. We've got one company who came out of Southampton University and it's a sustainable chemistry company. Very, very inspiring. We're working with a naval architect and a marine conservationist to develop video activities for bespoke for students in Portsmouth. So they'll be ready soon. The other thing that we're doing, because obviously the video development takes quite a lot of time. We're working in collaboration with the University of Portsmouth and these companies. These people are giving up lots of time to get it absolutely perfect. But in the meantime, we were like, we still want to be giving the, the STEM opportunities to students in areas that we teach in so we designed an escape room so we've got a digital escape room the first one that we ran was in september and it was all about sustainable futures linked to the royal academy of engineering resource box um, we had 5500 students access that escape room it was incredible <laughs> all free uh, we're working in collaboration with the Royal Academy of Engineering and we're going to run another escape room. So when the PowerPoint is distributed, there is a little video and it just gives you a taste of the Sustainable Futures escape room that we ran in September. Uh, but the next one is all about the future of flight. So that will set you up if it's aimed at key stage two to three. And then so the students can attempt the escape room. And then if you're interested, then you can attend my network meeting in the spring term where you'll receive uh, 15 class sets of um, equipment and curriculum linked activities linked to the future of flight. Um, there's a couple of other things that I put on the slide. So once you get the PowerPoint, have a look. I thought I'd mention that there's three opportunities this term. So there is a STEM networking event at Winchester Science Centre where they're going to pitch all of the STEM opportunities in the area and give you a free planetarium show and an opportunity to have a quick look around the centre because all the exhibitions have been updated. The second opportunity is there is a collaboration between the Institute of Physics, Physics Partners and the UTC and Winchester College and STEM Learning and they're going to put on a programme of free physics CPD for teachers and they're going to run it in Portsmouth, Southampton and Winchester. All the dates are on the PowerPoint. And then the final opportunity, of course, is my escape room. So please do come and join me for that and keep an eye on our website. So we've got um, community and we've got STEM Academy South on social media. Um, follow us and we'll keep you updated on our activity development. Um, but yeah, you should find all of the information on the slides and then I'm, I'll pop my email into the uh, chat because if anyone would like to get in touch or be involved in any of our projects, then you'd be very welcome to. Thank you very much. That was whistle stop, Laura. You're a superstar. Um, we have got some people here from the Sonam, but we've got people here from elsewhere in the UK. So obviously access to some of those activities in and around Winchester is going to be tricky. Are there, do you have colleagues elsewhere in the UK or is there a central place that other people can go to? Absolutely. There's 52 teachers coordinators across the country so I can guarantee if you'd like to be part of the um, Connecting STEM Teachers Network um, I'm happy for you to get in touch with me or if you go onto the Royal Academy of Engineering website there's also an email address and they'll put you in touch with your teacher coordinator and so there's basically one of me in every area and so we're all trying to do the same thing we're all trying to gather all the opportunities and put them in one place so that everyone because there's nothing worse than hearing is that oh i would have loved that but i missed the date so we're trying to work collaboratively with lots of different organizations um, but yeah anyone from anywhere else in the country obviously jordan is uh, running stem academy uh, north out of sheffield so if anyone would like her contact details uh, she's doing stem story times for primary schools as well um, but also if anyone would like to be part of the Connecting STEM Teachers programme so they get the free box of resources and student kits every term, then um, yeah, just get in touch and I can put you in touch with whoever your nearest teacher coordinator is. Fabulous. There's another question in the chat, which is obviously you're talking about schools. Do you do anything for FE aged children yet or is it just school aged children? Not yet, <laughs> but we are. We're looking at our plan of what we can offer all the way through. Because obviously there's um, and, and I had some really exciting conversations this week, actually, with um, some women in tech who are interested in supporting students at that age bracket as well. So watch this space.
Fantastic. And I know that from conversations that you and I have had before, that you're very keen to be an ally for science teachers who want to use STEM and to see it better embedded across other subjects as well. So um, I think uh, I think it's really key that we highlight your um, the fact that you're here. Well, you're in your car. The fact that you're here, that STEM community exists and it's a way of, um, you know, today's nearly over, Richard. I just saw you looking at the sea. I can just imagine it's been I've got three big things on this week and this is one of them. The other one was this morning and then I've got a thing on in London tomorrow after which I'm just going to crawl into a dark corner somewhere. It's been quite the week. Anyway, that aside, uh, Laura, you're an absolute superstar and a trooper. Imagine joining us from your car. It's no great surprise that the presentation didn't run because unfortunately Engineering UK's one started and then stopped and it seemed to have broken teams, I think. And then the Talus one wouldn't work either. Kinetic, I have to say, they get the prize. Um, yeah. Their presentation worked, but um, um, we've had, I mean, I, I don't know what everyone else would say. I would say this has been an absolutely packed session. Fantastic information, kind of demystifying um, uh, engineering. And uh, and I hope that's been really useful for everyone who's joined. The whole session has been recorded. I will, um, I'll make sure that with the recording, we upload the, the um, upload the recording but also access to the slide decks as well um, and I hope I hope you found that useful and then just um, just from me we've got three more CPD sessions coming up before we all put on our Christmas jumpers so uh, we're doing one about work boats with Serco and Border Force we are doing one with the Royal Yachting Association exploring careers in water sports and as a water sports instructor and we're also doing one with the British Ports Association looking at ports as a large employer uh, as a large employer. So those are all coming up. I'll send you links for those as well so you can register. And I'm just so grateful to our industry colleagues and um, to Annette and to Laura for for also giving up your time and preparing these presentations. Um, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much. Hugely appreciated. Bye for now. Thank you. Lovely. Thank, thank you. Bye all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really wonderful.